Whether you think he was indestructible, whether you think he was unbeatable, whether you think he was the best martial artist that walked the face of the earth, or whether you think he was largely a product of press hype, Bruce Lee had legitimate fighters attached to him. Now, before everyone starts throwing their hats in the air and declaring Bruce Lee was the best of all time, in and of itself, that does not make him a fighter. It means he had something to offer in the same way that Custer Mato did to Mike Tyson. Being a good coach and able to bring something out in purple does not make you necessarily the best fighter. At the end of the day, does it really matter how good Bruce actually was? I would argue not, because it's Bruce's ideal. It's his example that actually sets the path for us to follow. Bruce Lee to martial arts is like John Wayne is to cowboys. His name is synonymous with the general public. In fact, if you were to ask anyone in the street to name a famous martial arts person, Bruce Lee would still probably be the most common name that comes forward. Even in the years of the UFC, of MMA, of all the increased exposure via TV programs like Cobra Kai, Mortal Kombat, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, all the good stuff that we grow up and love with, Bruce Lee still sits at the top of the pile. His presence here is the same thing that makes him beloved by so many and hated by so many in equal measure. One of the reasons that Bruce Lee attracts this absolute vitriol from certain areas of the martial arts community is the belief that he was God on earth. Bruce Lee could do anything. He could kick faster than a speeding bullet. He could chop, dice, and liquefy. He could break concrete just by looking at it. Chuck Norris facts of Bruce Lee truths. All the things that you put out there, Bruce Lee has had them claimed about him. Yet at the end of the day, he was a man. He was a man with an awful lot of flaws and an awful lot of faults. And he was also someone that came along in an era where the ability to prove yourself as a martial artist wasn't actually that easy to do. In days where we see video evidence, fights, testimonials, all these bits and pieces that go into making up the complete martial artist in our public perception, we forget that back in the day, you had a reputation, and that was about it. Bruce Lee smashed through that by bringing it to the movie screen. And it's this why so many people dismiss him. He was just a movie star. That's all he did. He got famous, and now everyone associates him with being a tough guy. You can argue this is the same thing that Van Damme, Segal, Jackie Chan, so many others built their reputation on. Is it accurate, though? Let's look at both sides of the coin and see what we can get. Bruce Lee, the movie star, is the first thing that everyone thinks of because that is still what he is the most well-known for. Prior to his advent, there was very little on the screen outside of the theaters that you used to see in Chinatown, outside of the Wuxia films, outside of Seven Samurai by Akira Kurosawa. Bruce Lee single-handedly defined a genre by bringing gritty, brutal, and savage fighting to the screen. So one person described it as a furious belay, and that's a pretty apt description if you actually watch a Bruce Lee film. The problem is so many people perceive this on-screen persona as who Bruce Lee was, and that's all they see him as, whether he's the on-screen superhero or he's just the film star. And a case can be made for either. But when you actually look at how he moved, his mechanics, the way his body was, Bruce Lee used his films to convey some of the core essences and truths he believed about martial arts. There was a theme, there was a process, there was a character development within it. And as was often said of Johnny Cage in the Mortal Kombat movies, I've seen the way you move, you can't fake that. Bruce Lee's athleticism was actually undeniable. Was he the greatest martial artist ever to walk the face of the earth? Irrelevant, he played it on television. When you see the way he acts and the way he moves, you believe that Bruce Lee in that film is fighting in the same way that you believe Daniel Craig is James Bond. His movement, his body language, his posturing, it brings you in. He isn't winning any Oscars for his performances, but he's certainly making the audience believe that he's the one doing that damage on screen. So Bruce Lee, the film star, ironically detracts away from Bruce Lee, the martial artist, because he's seen as a celluloid performer, the spectacular stunts, the kicks, the cat cries, all the things that look so exciting on the screen. When you try and translate that to reality, don't look so real anymore. 
Remember, this was pre-UFC. This was pre-self-protection. This was pre the self-defense industry overhauling the myths and fabrications that the martial arts industry had been selling for years. So you see these high kicks, these quick punches, and these groups of people being taken down one at a time. That's a dramatic device, which unfortunately was seen as being representative as realistic because it was a shift in the genre. This is what cost Bruce Lee his reputation. The films themselves are guilty pleasures of mine, in particular Way of the Dragon, and in particular that fight scene where the dragon with Chuck Norris. But when you watch the techniques, the movements, and the tactics within that fight scene, you can see that Bruce, who directed, wrote, and choreographed that entire film himself, got it. He understood the principles of combat. So as well as being a very accomplished martial arts film star, he was able to fight as well. Bruce Lee, the martial artist, is something which always stirs a controversy. Let's get one thing out of the way. A lot of people will say Bruce Lee did have a competitive record because he boxed in high school. That's a little bit like saying I'm a mathematician because I passed my GCSEs. No, Bruce Lee had a little bit of a rook in a high school boxing match and he won it for a guy called Gary Elms. Not much of a career, certainly not one that you can point to to describe him as being this ultimate fighter. However, this was back in the day when access to a lot of tournaments and a lot of ways to prove yourself weren't as openly available as they are now. These days when you talk at the best performing martial artists on the planet, you can point to MMA fighters, you can even point to wrestlers, you can point to jiu-jitsu fighters, you can point to kickboxers, Muay Thai fighters, you can point to almost anybody because we've never had this much access to martial arts information. Bruce didn't have those opportunities. I'm not saying he had none, but he didn't have them in the same way. So, when we take off a lot of the evidence which he's put forward for proving Bruce Lee as a fighter, when he gets under the microscope, it doesn't necessarily stand up to scrutiny. To gauge Bruce as a fighter, we have limited access to footage of him. There's some backyard training footage, there's the sparring footage from the Long Beach, and there's the demonstrations that he did. Bruce's physical feats were actually quite impressive, in particular the one-inch punches that he used to demonstrate so effectively, the speed demonstrations he used to demonstrate effectively, and the board breaks he did on Japanese television. But like he said himself, these are party pieces. They don't prove anything. Bruce's ability to fight and his reputation as a fighter, although built on celluloid, is firmly grounded in reality. When you want to look at whether Bruce Lee was capable as a fighter, because he's not here, because he has no record, we have to take a look outside and we have to look at the people that he trained with. First and foremost, his first student was Jesse Glover. Jesse Glover was a judo black belt and had some hefty, hefty hands. He was a quiet man on the circuit. He used to do very small seminar circuits, would insist you called him Jesse, would not answer to Sifu or any other honorifics like that. But Jesse was a very capable fighter and a very, very dangerous man. He wasn't a Jeet Kune Do fighter. He was a non-classical Kung Fu fighter and he found his own way through the maze. Bruce Lee was also trained, not just by Ip Man, which is what everybody knows, but by a gentleman called Fu Kyung, who was actually related to Bruce. And they actually were roomies and hung out at Ruby Chow's together. Fu Kyung was actually a red bolt Wing Chun stylist and a fearsome fighter in his own repute. He was someone that could demonstrate some absolutely breathtaking moves and frankly some stuff which looks like sorcery. His reputation was there for all to come and try. In fact, in one session, combat, when Fu Kyung came in to teach one of Bruce's back. backyard sessions and the students so didn't feed Fu properly, Bruce castigated them publicly. Whether you believe Bruce himself was capable or not is up to you. But when you look at gentlemen like Ed Hart, Jesse Glover, Larry Hartzell, Danny Nasanto, all these gentlemen within their own rights and their own abilities were absolutely fearsome fighters. Competition fighters, Mike Stone, Joe Lewis, Chuck Norris. All these people saw value in what Bruce Lee was offering. Whether you think he was indestructible, whether you think he was unbeatable, whether you think he was the best martial artist that walked the face of the earth, or whether you think he was largely a product of press hype, Bruce Lee had legitimate fighters attached to him that not only respected what he was doing, they chose to learn from him. 
Now, before everyone starts throwing their hats in the air and declaring Bruce Lee was the best of all time, in and of itself, that does not make him a fighter. It means he had something to offer in the same way that Custer Mato did to Mike Tyson, in the same way that Manny Stewart did to Lennox Lewis and Evander Holyfield. Being a good coach and able to bring something out in purple does not make you necessarily the best fighter. But what it does show is you understand combat, you understand combat principles, and you're able to translate those principles into physical action so that other people can use them successfully. Now, to add evidence to the pile, all the gentlemen I've mentioned talk about their sparring sessions with Bruce, talk about their training sessions with Bruce, and talk about how hard and arduous they were, how hard Bruce Lee punched, and how hard he kicked. None of them say he was indestructible. They just say he was very, very, very good. At the end of the day, does it really matter how good Bruce actually was? I would argue not, because it's Bruce's ideal. It's his example that actually sets the path for us to follow. Bruce Lee, the idol. Bruce Lee, the film star. Bruce Lee, this mythical figure within martial arts, has inspired so many people down the path to self-perfection, to get themselves off the couch, to learn to protect themselves, to make themselves better people. That's vital. That's laudable. So the reality behind it, is it important that God has clay feet? I would say not. So what benefit do we get from the exercise? What does this have to do with a reality check? What does Bruce Lee's ability as a fighter really bring to the table when we're talking about self-protection and the realities of world combat? It brings to the fore the idea of subjectivity and objectivity. If you can make a subjective case for why you like something, no one can assail you on that. Bruce Lee was the best person in the world because I like his films and I think he was great. I can't dent that because there's nothing for me to dent into. That case is not articulated on facts. That case is articulated on thoughts and feelings. So I put my case forward for Bruce Lee. For me, he was a real fighter. Not just because of what you see him on film doing. Not just because of what he did or didn't do in competition but because real fighters trained with him and said he was. I would take their word over the word of people that just don't like his movies any day of the week. Thank you very much for joining us this week, guys. It's been a while, I know. Thank you for still with us, watching the content, putting the comments out there, and sharing it around the net. As always, I can be found on Facebook, Aftermath The Fight After The Fight, and my YouTube channel of the same name. I'm on Twitter at Aftermathematic, and I'm also on Instagram at Havoc Hound. Huge thank you once again, as always, to the Budo Brothers, my partners in crime here. Check them out at budobrothers.com. Find them on Facebook at Budo Brothers. And I strongly, strongly suggest that you look into their catalog of goodies and goodies that they have there. It's still, to date, the best martial arts equipment I train with. I'm not saying this just because they're my friends. I'm saying it because it's true. And I'll leave you to make your own objective decisions as to whether it's the best when you go to their website, buy some of their goodies, and tell them the hound sent you. Till next time, guys, take care of yourselves and each other. Please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you all soon.